we've been watching the development of this technology and what's happening is it's becoming significantly cheaper, uh, much easier to do, and it's reached the point where it now is really available for the public at large. Uh, at Discovery Health, we like to be at the forefront of new health technology to make it available to our members. And so really a big push uh, for our interest in this is just being able to offer Discovery Health clients this brand new technology at a very affordable price. What will happen in this journey is that up front, before any member can enter this process, there will be quite a detailed consent form because people really do need to understand what they might learn from this, what, you know, what the test does, does not offer. You know, you can learn information that may cause anxiety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as part of that upfront process, we will strongly encourage people to have what is called pre-test counseling. That is where you talk to a counselor before your test about what you might learn from the test. Uh, that's not going to be a mandatory process, but it will be strongly encouraged. Once the test is done, um, if your results are benign in the sense that there's nothing significant from a clinical point of view, uh, you will get the report and that's the end of it. If the report has identified you know, one or more genetic variations that are linked with the risk of a disease, for example, you, 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 clients will actually only be able to get that report through a counsellor that we will refer them to or through their GP. We can give an ironclad guarantee that no member will ever be identified in this database. So once your sample is taken um, and your, your exome is sequenced, the report comes back to you, the sample is destroyed, and the de-identified data then goes into the database that is stored. In other words, it's not ever linked to your name. Um, and it is secured extremely securely, you know, to the highest standards of security required by the US government, which is very, very high standards. Um, so firstly, there's security against data breaches, but also because it's depersonalized or de-identified, no individual member will ever be able to be linked back to their own DNA data. Um, the, the other important thing about the database is that we will also have access to the anonymized data. Um, which we can make available to local researchers who could do really quite interesting research on South African genetic material. Um, but that's a, an added benefit of the program. I can't think of a disease that's not covered, covered by discovery of medical scheme. So because of the PMBs uh, that are required by law and because of our very rich benefits, you know, virtually any disease you can think of is covered, including all the rare genetic conditions. And we have, because our cover at Discovery is rich, most of the patients who have one of those rare genetic conditions are actually with us already. So I don't see that being a significant problem. Um, you know, at the, at, it's also important to point out that by law, a health insurer can't charge you more premium if you've got a genetic condition can't impose uh, you know, any other underwriting. So people are not increasing their risk uh, in relation to their health insurance by having the test. In South Africa today, life insurers do ask you whether you have had a genetic test, all life insurers, including Discovery Life. Um, and uh, we expect that unless the law changes, life insurers will continue to ask you that. And so I do think in our consent, we will say to, uh, to potential clients who want to use the service, be aware that your insurer, your life insurer, uh, or if you take out a new life insurance policy, may ask you if you've had a genetic test, in which case you'll need to disclose that, and they may ask you for the results. So that is something people need to be very aware of. I think we're at the beginning of a period of very rapid change um, in, in healthcare, uh, driven largely by this genomics revolution. Um, and really, I think you can describe the change very simply from a, a, a medical approach today of one size fits all, 
where all our evidence, for example, for treating diabetes or heart disease or high blood pressure is based on, you know, how uh, a population of patients respond to a particular drug or a particular intervention. And we then take that evidence that was done in a trial and we say, let's treat everybody the same way with the same standard dose. And the truth of the matter is that every body is different. Each person's body is different. Quite a lot of that is determined by our genetics. And I think we're moving from one size fits all medicine and healthcare to a personalized era where actually we will look at you and your heart disease and your genetics and we will say for you, this drug at this dose will work but it won't work for the person next door, even though we used to treat you both the same. So that I think is the best summary of the shift. It's, we're not there yet, but I, I would say, you know, year by year we're moving quickly. And if you fast forward five or 10 years, we absolutely will be in that era. From our point of view in discovery and, and with our vitality f- focus on wellness, we're also, I think, gonna see a move from wellness recommendations, one size fits all, to very personalized recommendations. So, for example, we'll say to you, you know, this kind of diet is good for your body, but it's really not good for that person's body. And exercise the same. You'll benefit more from high intensity frequent, whereas, you know, somebody else will benefit from, you know, low intensity longer exercise, for example. So I think it's, a, it's all a shift to say we are actually all quite unique. We have very different characteristics and this genomics is becoming cheap enough to allow us to say, let's look at you as the unique individual that you are and treat you in that way. Some people are keen to know everything. So I'm the kind of person that says, look, even if it's like a risk of, uh, of Alzheimer's, and as we stand today, there's not that much that can be done. I'd actually like to know I've got that risk. I sort of, I think I know that I'll be able to put it away and not lie awake in bed worrying about it. But also I'll be very alive to new research. You know, I'll look for the, the, the latest and the best treatment. There are other people, um, including colleagues here in Discovery, who say, I don't want to know anything about this. So just, you know, I'm happy to just keep living my life. Don't tell me what I don't need to know. And there's a group in the middle who say, I'd like to know about things where I can take action, cancer, but don't tell me about things where I can't take action. So I think the world's made up of three groups when it comes to genomics. Um, We're going to try and design the report so that people can almost tailor what they see. So we will allow people to say, I only want to see actionable findings. Don't show me things I can't take action. So that's kind of what we're thinking. But, you know, I'm, I'm definitely first with my hand up. I'd like to know whatever there is to know.